Good evening. This is Dr. Lewis Foley, one of the exam pro faculty. I want to welcome you to the oral board prep webinar for Thursday, November 7, 2019. Tonight's going to be a caseless defense style of webinar, and we are going to go ahead and get started. First, I want to take you through the GoToWebinar software control panel. The little orange box with a white arrow allows you to collapse or expand the control panel so it can be out of your view during the webinar. The upper portion of the control panel determines how you will participate from an audio standpoint. By default, the software will usually choose the microphone and speakers on your computer. However, if you prefer to use a telephone or if you're in an environment with a lot of background noise where it may be a better idea to use a telephone, you can certainly do that by clicking Audio Setup, use Telephone, you'll be given a number to dial in, an access code that you'll have to follow with the pound sign, and then an audio PIN number. The auto pin number also has to be followed by a pound sign. And this is a critical step because if you don't enter the audio pin number followed by the pound sign, I will not be able to unmute you during the webinar. The bottom portion of the control panel we do not use, so please don't type any questions in there because I won't know that you've done so. The little raise a hand feature is the way that we know that you want to be in the hot seat or that you have a question. So. Uh, please, by all means, do click on that. And I do want to remind you that all of our webinars are recorded. So if you have uh, a reason to get access to a recorded session, contact our exam pro staff and they can help you with that. Now, we are going to go ahead and get into the case list defense type of webinar. And what I'm going to do is get the case list so that we have them. Let me just click out of here and click right here. Okay. I think we're good here. Okay. Now, I want to do one thing. Um, I want to find out, I received word of a, at least one question from earlier in the week, actually on a webinar session that I was not a uh, party to, and I'm going to give feedback on that question. And I want to find out if there are any other questions. So before I take volunteers, I'm actually going to put down the raise a hand feature on everybody. So I just clicked it down. So everybody's raising their hands down. If you have a question from something earlier in the week in a webinar, if you will click the raise a hand feature, I will get to you and answer those questions. So if you do, just right now, we'll go ahead and deal with that. Okay, I don't see any. So that's good. So now I am looking for volunteers. If you're interested in being in the hot seat, if you will click the raise the hand feature at this time, I will be calling on you to be a volunteer. Let me just give you one second. Dr. Zanat, are you there? Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Is it, yes. Is it okay if Can I go to you first? Oh. Yes, absolutely. Do you have a preference which list we look at? Perhaps the OB, OB list. OB or Okay. Um. I guess anything. I did have a couple of um, cases that I wasn't 100% sure about, so maybe one of those. Like case number 36. Right, just, okay, just one second. Let me just pull it up. Just waiting on the technology here. Sorry for the delay. No problem. 36, you think, correct? Yep, page 14. Okay. Okay, now do you have a specific concern about this case, or is it about the case itself? 
Um, particularly the maternal unresponsiveness, like how to uh, defend that. Now, when you say maternal unresponsiveness, so the patient's vital signs were still appropriate or the patient coded? Um, patient did not code. She became completely unresponsive, but and tachycardic and hypoxic with a fetal bradycardia, but um, with very deep uh, sternal rub, she would open her eyes and sort of mumble. Okay, so let me ask you this. <clears throat> Do you know what type of anesthetics they were using? I had asked the anesthesiologist and he did not give me a, any answer. I assume in terms of my differential for why that happened, I think possibly a high spinal. Uh, maybe he did a combined CSE and that's why she became, and it was a high level and she became um, unresponsive and symptomatic. Now you mentioned on the case list an epidural, but you think it might've been a spinal epidural? That is, um, so just a little background, this particular anesthesiologist, it, this often happens uh, with his uh, epidural and the ones that this doesn't happen, his practice is to put CSC in most of our, um, most of them and not just a straightforward epidural. Okay, so what do you think if, it, well, let's assume that it was a, a spinal. Now, a high spinal, I generally think about we get a higher dermatome level than we were expecting and we'd be worried about potentially respiratory compromise. Would you agree with that? Yes, because she was hypoxic and tachycardic, um, but she did not have an AFE or did not have, did not code, um, I can only assume that it may have been a high spinal. Did she have to be intubated? She, we, when we did the STAT, um, we requested the intubation, so yes. So she was intubated? Yes. Okay. Can you think of anything else that might explain a change in uh, neurologic status, but with stable vital signs in this scenario? So one of the other things, it could be like she had a pulmonary edema and that led to the vital sign changes that I saw. Um, another could be obviously a uh, massive PE, which is why she had a CT angiography later on that was uh, normal. Um, I mean, I suppose you can have a cardiac event, but it would be weird that there was postoperatively when we evaluated things, she, there was no issue. The other thing I'm wondering about is, and I don't mean to, to interject and give you feedback, but I, but the thing I'm wondering about, uh, especially if it was a combined spinal epidural, if they used a local anesthetic and accidentally got an intravascular injection at one point, that potentially could cause um, some neurologic changes uh, that might come short of actually having a seizure or uh, a cardiac event. Uh, so that's the other thing that just kind of, because a lot of times they will put a local anesthetic into the spinal. Um, right. So, I, you know, I mean, it's the other thing that kind of comes to mind. The patient after the cesarean delivery was extubated and then taken to the recovery room or she remained intubated and went to the ICU? She was extubated and she did fantastic. Yeah, that's tough. And and post procedure, you weren't able to get much information out of the anesthesiologist. Correct. So what I would focus on for this particular case in preparing for Dallas, I would look at the practice bulletin on OB anesthesia, if you haven't already, okay? Um, it does a nice job kind of covering all the possibilities, and it's probably the best source of potential questions, okay? Uh, the other thing that could come up here 
they could make this into a code. What if the patient coded? I don't usually think about getting ACLS type questions in the exam, but you probably are ACLS certified, I would imagine. Right. So it might, you know, again, given this particular scenario on your OB list, it might be useful to at least have a brief review of sort of the, the overall ACLS protocol not memorizing every drug or anything like that because again you're going to be part of a team but at least thinking about that in case they ask you you'll be able to say a few sentences about it you won't be freaked out those would be the kind of things looking at this that i would think about now it also looks like that the fetus itself was fine uh, with right. afgars at eight and nine uh i'm looking at the acute blood loss anemia that was because Whoa, we had what? I don't see postpartum hemorrhage or anything here. I don't see a pre-op anemia. What was the deal with that? Um, to be perfectly honest, the surgery didn't seem like it was uh, very bloody. It was normal amount of blood loss, um, but her, I don't remember her pre-operative hemoglobin. Post-operatively, post-operatively, it was like seven and it, seven and change. Okay, and so. And she was symptomatic, and she did not get a transfusion, though. She was asymptomatic, so she did not, she did not get it. Asymptomatic. Okay. Okay. So you were just noting that the hemoglobin was significantly lower. Um, right. Okay. Let me ask you another question here. So I see in the antepartum complications column, fetal bradycardia. Right. Now, it's, it's, this, I assume, was after the epidural was placed. Correct. Right? Yes. Assuming that if the patient had normal mental status, what would you say about fetal bradycardia following an epidural? Likely secondary to low blood pressure, and which happens after an epidural placement. That's why they try to do fluid. Um, prior to placing epidural, um, they get a certain amount of fluid before because you have an expected um, vasodilation from the epidural. And it should recover Good. most of the time. Perfect. And what's the treatment for maternal hypotension if uh, you have that following an epidural placement? Vasopressor, so you can give um, epi, um, epinephrine. OK, now I usually think that you would probably start with ephedrine. Yes. Okay. So that's worth knowing. Okay. And I'm thinking maybe like 10 milligrams, but I would double check that. Okay. Um, that would be given by anesthesia usually, but it's worth knowing. Okay. Uh, I'm just trying to see if there's anything else in this case. Otherwise, things look fairly straightforward. Now, the CT angiography was done as a abundance of caution. Abundance of caution. Right, after the surgery. And it was normal. And it was normal. Yes. Yeah, I, those are yeah, the thoughts I, I, have about the thoughts this case. I have about this case. I'm not sure why we're getting the echo all of a sudden. Getting the echo all of a sudden. <laughs> um, I'm not sure either. So, Nothing changed yeah. on my end. But you don't think like the maternal unresponse beyond, because I don't really know why it happened. So beyond just like what the workup was, um, can't really say much more than the differential so it's interesting because, it's interesting when, I because about, when i think oh, about oh, you know what i'm going to do i'm going to have you mute your side for i'll mute it for a second just a second just a second just a second just a second i have to find you on the control panel. you want me to mute it nope i got it nope i got it okay this hopefully will solve that problem um, what I was going to say, so as far as potential causes go, maternal unresponsiveness, um, you know, it's, it's a tricky thing because it doesn't sound like the, the patient obviously didn't have a code. There's no mention here about the patient having an issue with blood pressure, per se. You mentioned tachycardia and hypoxia. And so I think this is really going to come down to the possibility of a high spinal, absolutely. The possibility of a intravascular injection of a local anesthetic. 
Um, the I guess the possibility, although it doesn't really seem like it, of some type of uh, seizure event. Uh, but I'm not sure that, you know, from the information that's available that I can give you any more of a differential than you and your team would have, um, having had all the information and being present at the time of the event. Uh, it's certainly going to get their attention. Uh, the fact that the patient did well um, favors some type of acute temporary event that's rapidly reversible, which makes me think about the po again, the possibility of an intravascular injection of local certainly would make me think that that could be, um, but I don't, I don't really have anything that I think that I can give you without a doubt that would be the answer. Unmuted. Okay. 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 Sounds good. No, I think, uh, I think a couple of the things you mentioned about just being familiar with the ACLS and what um, possibility of the intravascular. Uh, medication from the epidural, whatever medication they use for the epidural um, adds to the differential, so I appreciate that. You're welcome, and I think if, if you think they did a spinal epidural, that certainly makes me think a little bit more that that could be possible. I'm going to let you out of the hot seat at this point, okay? Unmuted. Sounds good. Thank you again. You're welcome. Let me just get back to the case list. Just one second. Dr. Langer, are you there? Yes, I am. Can I go to you next? Yes. Okay, just one second. Do you have a preference which list we work from? I was going to go with GYN, but I know you just did that. So if you want to do something else, that's okay. Actually, we were on OB. So yeah, we can oh, sorry, do yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, GYN. That's fine. Okay. Let me just get your list. Sorry, I was looking over something else when you were still talking with her. Yeah, no problem. It should be there because I saw it the other day. Yeah, it is. We're having this intermittent problem. Hold on one second. Because what I have to do is I have to actually close this. We've been through this and figured out what to do here. And then I have to actually reopen it from here. And now it should come up. These case lists are actually maintained at an exam pro site. Okay. And for some reason, sometimes they don't cooperate. All right, now we should be good. Perfect. Oh, you passed it. Yeah, no, it wasn't me. Oh, okay. the, oh sorry. Yeah. Okay. It, yeah, the software is super sensitive. All right. Uh, like doing laparoscopy with an assistant that can't run the camera. It's really tough. <laughs> Yes. All right. So here we go. Uh, give me one second to look through the list. A little further down, there's some other things that are more like ectopics and stuff like that if you're looking for something else. I'm looking, I'm looking to see what the, the flavor, obviously the flavor is very much Eurogyne. Yes. And uh, that's okay. I'm just looking to see what else is in here. Just to...
Okay. So just give me one second because I want to okay. make this um, useful for you. Okay, what, have you talked about your ectopics before? I have not yet with someone. Okay, let's do that then because I think that's going to be the easiest thing for if if we weren't doing it in the webinar and I had more time, I would try to manipulate one of your other cases um, because that's what they're going to end up doing. They're, they'll probably ask you a few things about uh, your organicology, but then they're going to start taking the case and say, okay, what if instead of this it was that? Um, because, right. because there's not enough, there's not a variety. It's fine. You'll be fine with it. It'll work out. Let's I mean, I, I do a little about, bit of GYN attending call, which is where these ectopics and stuff come from. Yeah. So. Yeah, so yeah. let's talk about case number 40. Okay. So first thing I'm going to ask you is, how do you make the diagnosis of an ectopic? Patient usually, I'm just going to present this, this scenario, I assume presented with some uh, abdominal or pelvic pain, vaginal bleeding, and a mismenstrual cycle, kind of the classic three things. Correct. So you get a patient who comes like that, how do you make the diagnosis of an ectopic pregnancy? So we initially start with, you know, anytime we evaluate a patient with those symptoms, with a history and physical examination, we look at her vital signs. In this standpoint, she was um, still hemodynamically stable, um, but she definitely um, was becoming more, uh, you know, creeping towards tachycardia, but it was not tachycardic yet. You could see a trend on her vital signs. Um, okay. We then also we proceeded with a beta HCG CBC um, after physical examination, um, and we also did a transvaginal or pelvic ultrasound combination, abdominal and transvaginal when needed, depending about the case. Um, from that. So how, how does yeah. how does the HCG help you in the process? Well, I want to confirm that she's pregnant, so we. You know, because oh, yeah, no, actually, yeah. how does the quantitative HCG help you in the process? Okay. Um, so, in if it comes back above a certain amount, you would expect to, like in this situation, I think hers was actually 3,800. Um, and so, we would expect to have seen something intrauterine. We did not see any intrauterine evidence of pregnancy for her, and she actually had um, evidence of. Oh, actually, it looked like a corpus luteum on her right side. And then for her, you could see um, a very enlarged tube on the left side that actually was like doubled back on itself, almost like a horseshoe. And it was very swollen and there was free fluid in the pelvis. Okay. Now, if you had the same HCG, 3,800, mm -hmm. and you had no IUP, and the anexa looked normal, and the patient was stable, what would you have done? Well, in our, in our hospital, in our institution, um, one of our big concerns is patients don't always follow up. So if she had really bad abdominal pain and I was worried with, you know, with some free fluid, even if the adnexa looked normal, I would typically lean more being more conservative and admitting them just for observation or not really admitting, but we have an observational unit in our emergency department where we can keep someone for an extended period of time for serial abdominal exams to make sure that, you know, to see if like in this situation with her tachycardia worsening to make sure that there's nothing else. Um, like an abdominal exam doesn't, you know, worsen with it where she doesn't get um, peritoneal signs or, you know, rebound or guarding. Um, okay. Okay. In this yeah. particular case, you did a left self injectomy. Did you consider trying to salvage the tube? This tube was not salvageable, and she, um, and she, I mean, I. It's a conversation to be had with patients. Um, I was also concerned her entire tube was swollen. It actually was um, kind of. By the time we got in there, it kind of um, erupted out of the back mid portion of the tube. Um, so I didn't think it was going to be salvageable from that standpoint. 
Um, but I also still had her concern of not following up to make sure if we did a salpingostomy to ensure that um, we followed her beta HCGs back to zero or negative. Okay. No, I'm assuming that the follow-up issue would have ruled out medical treatment even if she was a good candidate. Correct. Is it true? Yes. Okay. But if she were reliable and follow-up were not a concern, what criteria would you use to decide that she was a good candidate for medical management? I would, um, if I could see a fetal poll, I'd want it to be less than, I believe, uh, seven weeks. I would want to make sure that we didn't um, have any signs of, you know, obviously rupture, et cetera, because that wouldn't make her a good, if she was ruptured or not hemodynamically stable, she would not be a good medical candidate. Um, I would also want to ensure um, that she didn't have a contraindication to like methotrexate. Um, I would want to ensure, I'm drawing a blank right now. I can visualize okay, the list in front of me, sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so this, this, this is the kind of stuff that's really helpful for this kind of a case. Um, mm -hmm. You know, things like there, there are the absolute contraindications, like if she had a, a issue related to methotrexate, either a comorbid medical condition for which methotrexate would be contraindicated, or a previous reaction or sensitivity to methotrexate itself. The relative contraindications, like a high HCG, usually we think about greater than 5,000, mm -hmm. a large adnexal mass in the 3.5 to 4 centimeter range, or cardiac activity. Uh, within a fetal pole, those would all be relative yes. contraindications because they impart a higher risk of medical treatment failure. Um, and we already talked about compliant patients that would be important, uh, and hemodynamically stable without evidence of rupture, which you already mentioned. So, if you had a patient who fit those criteria, and you were going to do medical management, how would you do it? Um, you could do different dosing. There's different like, you know, protocols that you can follow. Um, at our institution, we would do a day one and day four protocol with two dosings. Um, we would, before we started it, ensure that she, just check a CMP, or just make sure everything was okay with her labs. Um, and we would want to make sure that her HCG level decreased appropriately. You would use methotrexate? On day one and day four? Yes. How would I have you to look it back up. Um, this is going to remind me I need to remember all my doses and not just into the protocol. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, I, I will not forget it now. Um, okay, I, not a, okay. yeah. I don't remember, I cannot recall it off the top of my head right now, but we okay. have it in a, So I would protocol. expect you're probably going to use 50 yeah. milligrams per meter squared. Yes. And That's you'll awesome. give that on day one and day four. Now, how mm -hmm. will you decide whether it works? You have to look at um, the decrease, and I believe it's on day, if you come back and you look at the decrease on day seven. Okay, good. Um, what, what, often, what often happens between day one and day four? Does the HCG go down? Stay no, the a lot same, of times it goes up a little bit. Okay. And then you'll compare from day four to day seven. Correct. And what are you looking for? How much do you want to go down? I wanted to, I think it's 50%. Isn't it? 50, five, zero? Yes. That would be awesome, but that's a pretty high bar. Okay. So I would, I, actually, I, would like, I, I, I can tell you in doing GYN attending call for three years, we have such bad follow-up. I've never actually dosed methotrexate in the last three years. <laughs> so. And that is good. I'm glad we did this this case. Yeah. I know how hard it is to do this case because you're feeling really self-conscious, and as anybody in the hot seat does. But the, what this tells us is that this is something to look at before Dallas. I'll just tell you this: there are a couple other things that are going to come up. So, you, of course, the 15% okay. is the is the criteria for knowing that it appears to be working. And then I'm going to ask you the questions just because I want to work through it okay. with you. But I'm going to give you the answers. After the 15% decline, then how would you manage the patient? So you do day four, you do day seven, okay. it's down by 15%. Now what will you do? 
you have to, you have to serially follow it. Perfect. How often are you going to follow her, and what are you going to do each time that you are seeing her? Uh, weekly. Weekly, I would agree. And what are you going to do? What's the most important thing you're going to do every week when the patient is presenting to your office, or how are you going to do this? Examine her. I mean, you're going okay, to. Okay. What? What else? You're going to. You check the beta HCG. Um, That's it. Check the HCG every week, right? Right. Okay, they're going to give you the scenario where the HCG is declining, and then at some point it plateaus. And when they tell you that, you're probably going to say, I'd recheck it in a week, which is what I would do. I would actually probably recheck it three weeks in a row, because that's kind of how you define a plateau. And they'll tell you it's plateaued. It's 300 every time you check it. So if they give you that, and they ask, what are you going to do next, what would you, you say? You can do a second, dosing, a second round of methotrexate. At that you point, can. Right? What are you what are you what are you gonna do first? Ultrasound. Actually, this is a little bit of a trick question. What they're gonna be looking for is that you'll do a urine Oh yeah, you test, it's not a urine HCG. Yeah. Yep, perfect. And then you can do an ultrasound, but if if you believe that this is a potential um, treatment failure, if you if you will, you can give a second dose. Now here, and for a second dose of a two-dose protocol would mean you actually give two doses, okay? So you give two okay. doses the first time, you give two doses the second time. If you have given two rounds of therapy, whether it's a single-dose protocol where you give two single doses or a two-dose protocol where you give two double doses, then you, if you do that and you still don't get resolution, then you need to think about surgical evaluation. That's the thing that they emphasize in the okay. practice bulletin on this, okay? Uh, last thing here before I let you on the hot seat. So if this patient asks you, what is my chance of having an ectopic in the future now that you've taken out her bad fallopian tube, what would you tell her? I would still tell her because, you know, she had something to put her at increased risk for her left side of, you know, tube, ect tubal ectopic that, that likely could have caused increased risk on her right side as well, so I'd still quote her a 10 to 15% chance. Perfect. I would agree completely. All right. Um, any questions for me before I let you have a hot seat? No, I appreciate it. That's very humbling. <laughs> yeah, no, no. You know what? Everybody has the things that they don't do every day that, you know, we can yeah. find this kind of problem for anybody. Even if I'm in the hot seat, you'll find things for me. So I yes. uh, don't, take it, don't take it bad. All right. We're going to move on. Dr. Gorju, are you there? I don't know if I said that right. I apologize if I didn't. Oh, let me try to unmute you again. Why is that? Okay, now are you there? Dr. Gorju? Gorju? All right, so it's not working on the unmute. If you can check on the, I'll try to come back to you in a minute. We'll see if it works at that point. Perhaps the um, the code, oh, I'm drawing a blank on the name. The last little code you have to put in is sometimes the problem. Let me, I'll come back to you on the next case. Dr. Rashina, are you there? Yes, hi. Hi, can I come to you next? Of course, thank you. Okay, do you have a preference which list we work on. Uh, no, any any list is okay. Why don't we go to office because we haven't been to that yet tonight. Okay, perfect. All right, here we go. Thank you. 
All right, let's talk about case number 27. Okay. So when the patient presents with postcoital bleeding, what are what are some of the differential diagnoses that you'd be considering? Um, so when the patient presents with postcoital bleeding, um, things I'm thinking about, um, well, based on her history, is it is it new? How long has it been going on for? Um, eliciting more of a sexual history, um, as well as you know thinking about things such as sexually transmitted infections, uh, chronic cervicitis, um, any history of abnormal Pap smears, uh, dysplasia, or history of you know cord knife cone or leap, um, what may be pertinent. Um, also, I'd be thinking a polyp or, you know, other lesion on the cervix. Okay, what's the most significant concern that you're worried about? Cancer. So I'd be, okay, you know, obviously want to rule out cervical cancer or even endometrial potentially, but most, most commonly in this situation, you want to rule out cervical cancer. Okay, good. So if I see postpotal bleeding, I'd be thinking about the things you said. Certainly cervicitis. Uh, a cervical polyp, cervical ectropion. I'm not sure if you mentioned that. That also no. could be related. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and then I have to always be thinking in the back of my mind about cervical cancer because it's about one in ten patients uh, with cervical cancer who present with their complaint of some type of postcoital bleeding or spotting. So this is certainly something we have to think about. Now I want to ask you, what is the normal age at which a patient gets cervical cancer? What is the, the peak incidence by age? Peak now, if I asked you about, if I asked yeah. you about ovarian cancer, what would you tell me for ovarian cancer? 60s. Yeah, 60 to 70. Mm -hmm. now, if I asked you for cervical cancer, what are you going to tell me? I'm thinking 40s to 50s. And that's a good thing to think. There's actually a bimodal distribution for cervical cancer. So we see a little mm -hmm. peak in the 30s and we see a peak in the 50s. Okay. okay, so this yeah. patient is certainly in the age range as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you did you did your PAP and your HPV co-testing, mm -hmm. and they were they were reassuring. Right. Mm -hmm. On your wet mount, tell me how you do a wet mount. Yeah, so I'll do a sterile speculum exam um, with a a swab. I'll get a um, sample of the discharge, uh, and I will you know put that on a slide. Uh, with um, normal saline, and I'll use a cover slip and take a look under the microscope. I also will check the pH of the discharge um, and do a KOH wet mount or KO, KOH prep as well. So, what are you expecting to see on the wet mount? Well, for I'd be looking for trichomonas. Oh, for trichomonas, I'd be seeing yeah. um, the the uh, modal, is it the flagella of the the trichomonad. Um, so you can see them swimming through the slide. Okay. What do you expect from the pH? The pH would be normal. Um, typically, in a 35-year-old woman, I would expect to see normal pH, unless, of course, it was, you know, consideration for bacterial vaginosis, in which case there'd be an elevated pH. And what is a normal pH? Uh, 4.5. Okay. Now, you treated the patient with metronidazole? I did. And did you do any follow-up evaluation? Um, so typically what I would do is treat them, and if symptoms don't resolve, I would you know, ask them to follow up with me. So it uh, looks like I only saw this patient for one visit uh, during this time period. Um, so typically you know, it doesn't look like I saw her for follow-up and that she okay. ultimately had improvement in symptoms. What did you tell her regarding the counseling about the diagnosis and the management? Mm -hmm. So I tell her trichomonas is a sexually transmitted infection um, that is oftentimes difficult to diagnose, um, but it is a common cause for an infection that might be causing her postcoital bleeding. I let her know that she, you know, it, it is sexually transmitted, so she should inform her sexual partners and that any of her prior sexual partners should be treated as well. Um, yeah. Would you would you offer her treatment for her partner? Uh, 
So, yes, I would. Okay. Uh, you mentioned STD screening. What other STD screening did you do? Uh, typically, um, in this situation, I would uh, offer her sort of expanded screening, uh, not only to include gonorrhea, chlamydia, but also HIV, hepatitis C, um, and hepatitis B, and syphilis. Okay. Uh, what do you think would be the most common cause of cervicitis? Would it be trichomonas? No. Um, I believe the most common cause is often idiopathic. Okay. Um, so I think if we're talking about an infectious agent, the most common is actually chlamydia. Okay. Chlamydia. I'd have to double. I'd have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure that the most common infectious cause of service. So again, you know, cervicitis. We're talking infection versus inflammation. Gotcha. And with infection, right. I think it would be chlamydia. I think it's um, and I think trichomonas is, is up there too. It's actually uh, probably under under appreciated, uh, under diagnosed. Yeah, and, it's, mm -hmm. and especially with these kind of symptoms, I would think of those two things as being much more likely than BV. Although mm -hmm. BV might be more common, but it's not more common in a, in a population of patients. But it's not really sexually transmitted per se, right? And not not as common with postcoital bleeding. All right, okay. let me ask you one more question here. When you say safe sex practices, besides um, making sure her partners get treated, what else did you tell her? Um, so I counsel her on barrier methods um, as a prevention for transmission of sexually transmitted infections, such as condoms, um, and also discussing use of lubrication, uh, such that you know certain lubrications can actually lead to you know um, uh, basically the condom could be you know less effective with things such as, um, well, anything, you know, essentially a water-based lubricant is recommended uh, for these patients. Okay, good. Yeah, it's surprising. There are a number of things that can actually break down condoms. Um, mm -hmm. One that people sometimes don't realize is actually Aldera, uh, which would be used for genital warts. So that can actually be an issue uh, that can break down condoms. Um, and then, uh, you know, anything that's not water-based would be a concern as well. Um, let's see, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else here. And I think I'm going to stop here. Any questions for me before I let you out um, In terms of the inflammation as a cause of cervicitis? Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes that's a chronic thing, or an atropion would be a chronic thing. In that situation, do you just give them reassurance? Um, or does it require further work? Yeah, for if if your diagnosis is an ectropion, mm -hmm. then I would expect that we would just give them reassurance. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's going to be common in younger patients, uh, right. also perhaps patients who are on hormonal contraception, mm -hmm. um, okay. but it usually does not need to be treated. Okay. Yeah, so essentially, uh, once we've got infectious causes and, and you know abnormal pap. Correct. Know, yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, you're, oh, one other thing I do want to mention. So mm -hmm. in a case like this, the other thing that could sneak in here, and I'm glad I didn't forget, it would be some type of urethral issue, okay? Mm -hmm. Like a uh, urethral caruncle or perhaps a distal urethral prolapse Okay. Um, that can sometimes get traumatized. Now, caruncle, just to refresh everybody in this, this is a fleshy growth that usually comes from the posterior uh, part of the urethral orifice, okay? It's benign, but mm -hmm. it can get traumatized and cause bleeding. So that would be another possible cause. A little bit less likely, but something mm -hmm. to think about. And if you, if you had something like that, you'd, you'd refer them to urology. Because they might, if it's a caruncle, they might really excite it. That's what they would do. So and keep that in mind. Yeah, I actually have yeah. a caruncle on my case in a case of a patient with postmenopausal bleeding. And it is yeah. more common, I believe, in postmenopausal women. The other thing, what about a urethral diverticulum? You probably, the urethral diverticulum possibly, but I would think of that as more like a urethral mass rather than postcoital bleeding. Okay. I mean, it could cause postcoital bleeding, but a caruncle in particular, and by the way, I kind of, I kind of um, short short-circuited the management because you usually start with estrogen, topical estrogen. Mm -hmm. If you thought you yeah. had a urethral caruncle, just for anybody listening, I don't want to uh, omit that step. 
but then if they don't respond to that, you're going to send them to urology. And so urethral diverticulum would certainly be possible, but it's probably not as likely for postcoital bleeding as a caruncle or a prolapse distal urethra. Okay? Okay. All right, great. Thank you. All right, good. Yeah, good discussion. Yeah. Let me just get back to the control panel here, and I will mute you, and we will continue. Dr. Gordieu, are you there? I'm trying to come back to you to give you another chance. Are you there? So on my control panel, I have you unmuted, but I cannot hear you. So usually this means that the access code has not worked. Are you there? Hello? All right, I'm going to move on. Um, but next time I do the webinar, I will try to get you in the hot seat. Um, I'm not sure what's going on tonight with that. Dr. Giannopoulos, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I'm come to you next, if that's okay. Sure. Do you have a preference which list we work from? Um, no. Okay. Why don't we go, how about we go to OB? Sure. I keep cycling around here. And change this. Okay, let's see here. Bless you. Thank you. No, I really came to tell you that our business still has to be put on hold. You see, we can't afford to be seen. Whatever it is. So as I'm looking through your list, I'm noticing that it seems like you have very few patients who deliver before 37 weeks. Is that true? Um, I have a few at the end that went into spontaneous labor, like before 37 weeks, I believe. Um, I had a few twins that delivered early. Um, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Um, I think I did have a few indicated, and maybe a few that delivered. Okay. I can't recall. All right, so let's see what let's do. Let's, let's, I'm going to start the discussion with this case, number 76, okay? Now, sure. granted, this is twin pregnancy, mm -hmm. but the first question I'm going to ask you is, tell me some reasons that would be appropriate medical indications for delivery prior to 37 weeks. So appropriate medical indications for delivery prior to 37 weeks um, would be inner uterine growth restriction um, and complications associated with that, such as if there were non-reassuring umbilical dopplers um, that were worsening over time, um, or if the IUGR was significantly worsening, um, if there was associated oligohydramnios, if there was an indicated delivery for preeclampsia with severe features or um, um, a patient who had chronic hypertension who had then become preeclamptic with severe features, a patient who had gestational um, diabetes that was worsening or poorly controlled with medication. Uh, twins um, could be whether they go into spontaneous preterm delivery or if they have a non-reassuring fetal heart rate status due to IUGR um, or twin-to-twin -twin transfusion sy syndrome. Um, what else could be a cause? Um, or um, something like a, if a patient had a previous history of a placental abruption or um, transmyometrial fundal surgery, you would want to deliver them early 
a patient with placenta previa, I would probably deliver around 36 weeks. And in our institution, if you have intrahepatic cholestasis, we deliver you between 36 to 37 weeks. Okay, good. That's a good list. Um, the things I didn't hear, um, obviously, if you have PPROM, I don't know if oh, you mentioned PPROM. that. Yeah. No, I didn't. That would be one. Uh, sure. The only other thing I'm trying to think about, I don't know if you mentioned pregestational diabetes with complications. That's another one that I always think about for a late preterm, like 36 to 37. You might, for instance, vascular complications or poor control. Okay. Uh, and I think you did a pretty good job covering the rest of that list. So this okay. particular case, the medical indication was preeclampsia with severe features, correct? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? So for this particular case, case 76, mm -hmm. the indication for delivery at 34 weeks was the preeclampsia with severe features. Yes. If she had not had that complication and it was monochorionic diamniotic twins, when would you have delivered her? If she did not have the complication of preeclampsia with severe features and she was mono dyed twins, um, I would have probably followed her between um, like 35 to 37 weeks. Okay, good. So this might still have been an, a uh, late preterm delivery, right. even without the complication of IUGR and severe features with preeclampsia. So tell me this. Uh, in this case, the, the management was, was, the patient actually was preeclamptic postpartum, correct? Yes. Okay, so the management was related to the IUGR and you induced the patient and you had a vaginal delivery of both babies. Yes. Mm -hmm. If the first baby delivered vaginally and the second baby had been breech, what would you have done in that scenario? So if the first baby um, was vaginal, but the second baby was breech, um, I would counsel the patient um, that an indicated cesarean delivery would be most appropriate for her. Um, I would also let her know, like if this, if this had been a diagnosis prior to her going into delivery and I knew the first baby was vertex and the second baby was breech, I would, you know, refer her to a physician who did um, the second twin breech extraction if that was something that she had wanted. Um, however, I always counsel my patients, even when they're vertex vertex, that there is a possibility that after the first twin delivers, if the second baby does vert to breech, um, then I would proceed with a C-section at that point. Okay. Now, betamethasone, who do you give betamethasone to prior to delivery? So betamethasone is something that I give to patients who are at risk of preterm delivery within the next seven days if they're between um, the age of, the gestational age of as early as 23 weeks up to 34 weeks. Um, and in our institution, we also give late preterm steroids to patients who are between 34 weeks and 36 weeks gestation if they haven't already previously gotten dose of steroids. Tell me how you administer it. We use betamethasone, um, a 12 milligram dose, 24 hours apart. Okay, so if this patient had developed preeclampsia with severe features before delivery, would you have delayed her delivery to make sure that the steroids were administered? If she, I don't delay delivery if the patient has severe features. We do try to get at least one dose of steroids on board because it doesn't really delay our delivery. And we believe that even one dose of steroids does have neonatal benefit, but we wouldn't delay the delivery 24 hours to give another dose of the steroids. Okay, now given this patient's history with this pregnancy, if she came to you for prenatal care for her next pregnancy, is there anything you would do differently because of the complications that she had with this pregnancy? Yes, I would start her on low dose aspirin um, starting at 12 weeks of gestation. And I would also counsel okay. her that she's at risk of having preeclampsia again in the subsequent pregnancy. Okay, what about um, 
interventions related to preterm delivery? So we do, for this particular patient, I would recommend, for all of our patients in our practice, that we do routine cervical lengths at our 20-week anatomy scan. But for this particular patient, even though it was technically a medically indicated preterm delivery, I think given the, all of these patients' risk factors um, and the low impact or low harm associated with a transvaginal cervical length, I would still offer it to her at 16 weeks. Okay, not a problem. Now, that's a, that's a little bit of a trick question, and you obviously were thinking about the fact this is a medically indicated delivery. We would consider giving her progesterone based upon this history. Um, the really most important intervention is going to be the low-dose aspirin. And then doing a cervical length, it's not a problem even to do a cervical length in all of your patients in their mid-trimester ultrasound, but this patient technically wouldn't qualify as high risk for preterm delivery based on this scenario that, that she had um, with this pregnancy. Let me ask you this. Besides a patient who's had preeclampsia, who else should get low-dose aspirin for prevention of preeclampsia? So there's certain um, major high-risk conditions and then um, other moderate risk conditions. So if the mom has a history of chronic hypertension, preeclampsia, or preeclampsia with severe features, um, if she has a history of pregestational diabetes, um, if she, I would have to double check the absolute major and minor. You need one major and two minor, but they include twin gestation, obesity, um, advanced maternal age, a personal or family history of preeclampsia and adverse outcome associated with those pregnancies. And based on the patient's criteria is how we guide the dosage of, um, or how we guide recommendations for aspirin um, starting at 12 weeks. Now, I think you said one high risk and two moderate. But I think what you meant was or two or, moderate, yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, when would you start the aspirin and when would you stop it? I would start at 12 weeks and I would continue throughout the duration of her pregnancy. Okay, and would you be concerned at all about um, bleeding complications because of the patient being on aspirin? No, because it's just a low dose aspirin of 81 milligrams. Okay, um, so some of the other conditions you mentioned, I just want to give, give this for everybody that's listening. You mentioned uh, hypertension, preeclampsia, pregestational diabetes, multifetal gestation is another risk, high risk factor. Um, you mentioned the history of preeclampsia, I think. And then uh, autoimmune disease like lupus would be another one, renal disease. And then for moderate risk factors, nulliparity, obesity, advanced maternal age family history of preeclampsia, uh, African-American race or low socioeconomic status are also moderate risk factors, uh, and then a personal history of a low birth weight, small for gestational age uh, in a previous pregnancy or a previous adverse pregnancy outcome, or a greater than 10-year interval between pregnancies. So these are some of the things for low-dose aspirin. Um, I'm going to stop here. Any questions for me before I let you out of the hot seat? Yeah. So in this patient, I get confused on who, if the patient has a medical indication for preterm birth, then are would it be appropriate to say that she would get the IM progesterone? No, I would not. The criteria for progesterone in a future pregnancy would be a spontaneous preterm birth. Okay. So in this case, if you had not induced her, she might not have delivered preterm. We don't know. She had twins, which, uh, you know, t twins is a different issue. But, but yeah, if she had a spontaneous preterm delivery, then we, a uh, singleton birth, then we would give her the progesterone. Now, I will just point out for everybody listening, because I'm, you know, current events, that the, there's this uh, recommendation from the advisory committee of the FDA to withdraw the indication for progesterone for prevention of preterm delivery that came out last week because the data um, in the follow-up study does not support the indication, meaning 
it did not show a improvement from progesterone in preventing preterm delivery. So we'll see what happens with that. But for the exam this year, it's going to be about what you were doing last year. And at this point, that's something it'll take time to work through. Okay. Um, the original the original studies on it were very convincing. They actually stopped the study early. So um, bottom line, singleton preterm delivery that was spontaneous. Okay? Okay. Got it. And, the, and if you want to see that in writing from ACOG, it's a practice bulletin entitled Prediction and Prevention of Preterm Birth. Okay? Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. I'm going to let you out of the hot seat. And... We are going to wrap it up here for tonight. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, and we will have another webinar on Sunday night at 8.30. Have a great night.